Hello, welcome to my podcast. How are y'all doing? I'm coming at you live from the Pacific... Well, not live. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest where the sun shines so bright. Just to rain a few hours later. Today I want to talk about more of a philosophical topic as opposed to going over numbers and statistics. I want to talk about simply the idea of things that we've seen popping up around the country... That's not necessarily new, but that has been incessantly increasing, especially in bigger cities and counties, especially those more left-leaning counties, and that is the proposal to ban straws, plastic straws, and uh, plastic bags in other countries. And I don't want to talk about the economic impact because I don't feel like that's a convincing argument. I feel like more of the philosophical argument talking about how these laws are enforced and whether or not they're good ideas, I find that far more interesting than going over numbers about whether or not banning plastic straws will have any significant impact on uh, plastic pollution, pollution, especially in the ocean. So the reason why this topic has been interesting is because not too long ago, I'd say around seven months ago, San Francisco, I believe it was, I could be wrong. You'll have to fact check me. I'll fact check myself in a little bit. Banned plastic straws. And as a result, we have, you know, we have uh, alternatives that are coming up. There's still straws, more, there's biodegradable straws, paper straws, metal straws, Bamboo straws, stuff stuff to act as an alternative. And that's fine. Kind of. Uh, I, I'll make that point clear later on as I sort of dive into it. And just keep in mind, this is an off-the-cuff podcast. This isn't me with any notes. This is just me talking philosophically. I wanted to talk about it, go through my thoughts a little bit, and see if I can make a convincing philosophical argument about why we shouldn't ban plastic bags or plastic straws, or, well, using the government to ban them. So banning is the right term. Anyway, uh, so as I was saying, to go back to the beginning in a way, San Francisco, I believe it was, not too long ago, banned plastic straws. We saw alternatives pop up. Portland, Oregon has banned plastic bags. That's been going on for a while now. That's a few years in the making. And they automatically use paper bags. Now, for anybody who doesn't live in one of these cities or counties that hasn't banned plastic bags... For the most part, most grocery stores by default give you a plastic bag. Most Americans understand that or are used to that, I believe, in any area that hasn't banned plastic. You have to ask for paper bags. And the reason is, I guess, to go to the economic argument that I wasn't going to make is that, well, I guess it's not an economic argument. It's more of an accounting argument or accounting fact. Paper bags are more expensive than plastic bags. And a lot of people don't like to use reusable bags because they're a hassle. Uh, sometimes, as a former cashier, that was my first job. Well, the my first place of employment, I ended up being trained as a cashier. And when you use reusable bags, it slows down the process, makes things less efficient, makes the cashier less proficient. Uh, you have fewer customers going through your line. And... A lot of people don't like them because a lot of bacteria builds up. You end up getting your groceries smashed and mixed because you're trying to stuff everything in this reusable bag. So that's one reason, for the most part, why most companies, most stores, most grocery outlets, any any retail store uses plastic by default. But there are a lot of people who like paper bags because they like them because they feel it's more efficient, it's more organized, or if they have a longer trip, it keeps things colder. And I'm going to try to bypass that already and get to the meat and potatoes. In my specific county, I believe it was the county, not just the city, they are having a meeting and they are going over the prospects of banning plastic bags. Now, we still allow plastic straws in this county. 
And a lot of people, uh, obviously, were opposed to it. Although, none of them really made convincing arguments other than they like plastic bags better. But if you're talking to an extreme environmentalist, as I like to call them, neo-environmentalists, they are not going to be convinced about whether or not a plastic bag is more useful for you. And to go over another accounting sort of statement or argument, a practical statement as well, as well as a, a, pra- a pragmatic argument, poor people use plastic grocery bags as small trash bags especially if you live in an apartment complex it, it just it saves you money on plastic bags where you just as soon as the plastic bag is filled you go to the dumpster toss it in whatever or you have a trash can with a bunch of small plastic bags anyway that that's an accounting practical pragmatic argument so a lot of my facebook friends and I try to get out of social media, but a lot of my Facebook friends, even right-leaning ones, who I would assume are more conservative, are 100% in support of banning plastic bags, and they cannot comprehend, for the life of them, the arguments, the poor arguments, as they would describe it, of people who don't want plastic bags to be banned. And they argue in favor of the environment, of course, saying this is a good idea, this will help you know, uh, reduce pollution in our oceans. And I was dumbfounded by the amount of conservatives that said this. But then it, I realized that most people aren't philosophical conservatives. Most people aren't conservatives because they think the philosophical argument, even the pragmatic and practical argument, and uh, what, what experience has showed us, so again, practical and pragmatic, that less government leads to human flourishing. They don't believe in the prospect of limited government. They have a bunch of ideals that they believe in for whatever reason, typically going by an individual issue, sometimes a more reactionary issue. They just tend to agree more with conservatives. And for the most part, it's really over taxes. That's about it. A lot of conservatives aren't economic capitalists by any means of the imagination. A lot of them support all these regulations that your garden variety liberal would support. And this is something I was noticing. So I decided, well, all right, let's do this podcast. Let me make this philosophical argument. So let's just take a take a look at what a law is. What 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 is the act of banning? What does it mean to ban something? And I'm not saying that in the postmodernist way. What is it to ban something? Well, you're basically saying that people do not have the ability to access this because it is outlawed. That is what a ban is. And a ban can be done for whatever reasons, for moral reasons, for environmental reasons, for health reasons. It's usually done underneath the the uh, talking point of it being either degenerate, so like uh, polyamorous marriages for the most part, I believe, are banned in most states. There's also the uh, the saving somebody from themselves argument, which is people, the type of people that would advocate for banning tobacco products, banning tobacco companies advertising on local stores. Many people support regulation for that, for that reason. There's also the societal argument that it's a degradation of society. So stuff like pornography, uh, cell phone uses, as we've seen Tucker Carlson come out in favor of banning cell phone usage for younger kids at a certain age. Those pe- are, are the drug war supporters, although I'd say that's a part of degeneracy, but it's different enough to be its own thing. So societal degradation, not just uh, moral degeneracy, people getting offended. And then there's health reasons. It's... It, it corrupts the individual morally, so that's, again, degeneracy, societal degradation, and then there's the fact that it's too harmful for somebody to take this drug, so therefore we should eliminate things like cocaine, heroin, we should ban it, and we should punish anybody who uses it. So that's what banning is, and how do you enforce a ban? Or how, how do you, not, let's not talk about enforcement, how do you implement a ban? Well, first of all, you have to use some form of legislation, which is some form of the legislative progress process, which is essentially, well, well, not essentially, it is the act of establishing a law. 
So what is what is a law? Well, it's in the books. It is something that is to be enforced by governments. There are federal laws that are enforced by the federal government, the state government, and the local government. There are state laws which are enforced by state governments and local governments. Then there are local laws which are enforced, local ordinances which are enforced by local police. And local police, as I said, enforce state laws and federal laws. So when you ban something, it is through the legal process and you implement a law. You establish a law and then you set a legal precedent when you start enforcing this law. And how do you enforce laws? Well, every single law is enforced through violence, through coercion, or through force. Now, you can say that I'm being extreme. All laws aren't enforced through violence. If you, for, exa- for example, if you outlaw murdering, you're not using violence to stop somebody from murdering somebody. Well, that's not true because if somebody murders somebody, then what is the proper course of action? You arrest that person using force. If you murder somebody and there's proof that you murdered them and you are being arrested, there is nothing that you can do because you are being arrested. It is against your will because you did the action of stripping somebody else of their right. That is force. Now, whether or not you want to call that violence is irrelevant because, again, it is coercion and it is force. Whether or not you think it's a positive or negative thing, and I would definitely agree that using coercion to take in a murder is a positive thing. So just so we're clear and so we can make sure we're on the same page, laws are enforced through coercion, violence, or force. Another example of this is say you damage somebody's property. Okay, well, what do you do? You're probably not going to go to jail, but you will be fined for breaking the law. And then you'll probably be responsible for paying the equivalent of the property that you damaged. And then some for the hassle of the person having to go through the legal process in seeking legal justice against you. Okay, well you're eventually going to be forced to pay that. So that is coercion because you broke the law. You violated somebody else's property, right? So you're going to use coercion force to get them into court, to get them arrested if they don't show up to court, and to force them to pay for those fines. Now let's say, all right, well, let's say, for example, that you didn't go to jail, but you still have to pay the fines, but you don't pay the fines. Okay, how is that force? Well, what happens if you don't pay the fines? You either get property seized or you go to jail. So that is coercion. That is force. That is how laws are enforced. Every single law in the books that carries a penalty or is enforceable through police action requires coercion or force. Not even just police action, even absence of police action. If it requires a court, a judge of some sort, then it is a law that is being enforced, again, by coercion and by force. So that's the philosophical argument that that I'm, I'm proposing to you to think about, even if you disagree with the premise of what I'm saying. Let's be 100% clear about this. Laws are enforceable through coercion and force, as they should be. So if we agree on that basic principle, whether or not you think force, is, force and coercion is used in a negative or a positive context... Let's just agree that's what it is. So think about that. What laws are you willing to use force, coercion, and essentially violence to enforce? So as I I stated earlier, and I think we can go back to that to circle it around because everything here is going to be interweaved, even if it is an off-the-cuff talk where I'm going through my thoughts live, technically. We can agree that murder is... A crime that should have force to enforce it. I mean, it's in the word enforcement, right? So if you murder somebody, yeah, the police should come, put you in cuffs, and haul you down to the jail. You should be forced to stand in front of a judge and uh, face legal process. And hopefully justice is served, and then you get driven off to prison. That is a proper use of force that I think is 100% justifiable and defendable in almost every aspect. 
What what other means of force can we agree on? If somebody comes into your house, starts uh, warning, this is going to get graphic. If somebody walks, breaks into your house in the middle of the night and starts raping your daughter, your 16 year old daughter. Sorry for being graphic. I'm just trying to make a point that there are there is some common ground. Or you you work swing shift, you come home, somebody broke in your house, and they're raping your wife. In that moment, you catch that happening. What do you do? Well, you use force to get them out of your house or to constrain them so police can haul them off. Or you take you take actual physical force and basically harm the person until they stop. That's a, that's a form of violence, coercion, or force that I believe is 100% necessary. And if the police come and haul off the, the raper, the rapist, I think that's a perfectly valid use of force that I think most of us can agree on. And then, of course, the action of police coming up and forcing them against their will because they attempted to force somebody else to do something against their will, especially in such a a degrading and dehumanizing manner, I think that is a justifiable, if not valid, 100% defendable reason to use force, aggression, coercion, violence. So just another moment or another thing that we could agree on, again, as I stated before, is a property crime. So I do think there is a necessary argument that force, violence, and coercion is needed. So when I say that laws are all force, I am not saying, let's just be clear about it. I am not saying that force isn't necessary or that force is bad because it is justifiable in many ways. But let's look at the prospects of small, petty things like plastic straws or plastic bags. If you support a a plastic bag ban, essentially what you're saying is, is that, yeah, I think we should use force, coercion, and violence to make sure people don't use plastic bags. Now, let me be clear and (laughs) let me make it, I'll be upfront about this. I am not stating that you think people should be aggressed upon in a violent manner by police officers for using plastic bags. But what I am saying is that the laws to enforce this are the same laws that would lead to a police officer or judge using force against a rapist, a murderer, a thief, or a vandalist. I just want to be clear about that distinction that that I'm making between what you the people who support these bans believe. And it, it probably hasn't even crossed their mind that these laws that are enforced, even small ones, are basically enforced the same way that every other law is enforced. Now, I, I don't envision a doomsday world where people are still using plastic bags when they are banned and then the SWAT is busting down the door and taking people out, shooting family dogs. That's not a doomsday world I'm envisioning. So I'm not doing this a doomsday fear-mongering scenario. So I, I want to be clear about that. But what I am saying, again, is that these laws are enforced the same way. Now let's go over the, the idea, the pragmatic argument, or the yeah, I guess pragmatic and practical argument that somebody might make against my position saying, okay, well, yeah, it's not going to lead to that doomsday scenario. People aren't going to be shot and put in handcuffs for using a plastic bag or a plastic straw. But what will happen? How do you enforce this law? You need to have a penalty to enforce the law. So what's going to happen? Well, you're probably going to get fined if you either use a plastic bag or your business that uses plastic bags. Okay, well, what happens with the fine? You're forced to give up a, a certain amount of your income or savings. That's force. That's coercion. What happens if you don't pay these fines? Well, you get properties seized from you. Asset forfeiture. Uh, repossession. Whatever. You, you want to uh, not repossession in this case because it's not loaned out. But nonetheless, that's force. That's coercion. That's against their will. 
What happens if you don't pay the fine or you resist your money or property being stolen from you? Well, then you do go to jail. So in essence, in uh, practical enforcement, these laws are enforced through coercion and violence. So that, that's a thought that I want to leave with you that I want people to think about. Now, the idea of using alternatives instead of plastic bags or plastic straws, am I against the idea of decreasing pollution? No, absolutely not. And again, putting aside the argument about how much of total plastic pollution actually comes from plastic straws, plastic bags, and how much we as Americans actually contribute to the worldwide quantifiable amount of plastic pollution, putting all of that aside, do I think we should have less pollution? Do I think we should have fewer pollutants, pollutants man-made pollutants in the ocean? Yeah, absolutely. I get that argument. Protect the ecosystem. Fantastic. I'm all for it. I am on board. I am in support. But I don't think it should be used through violent means. So, for example, one thing I would support is maybe finding some sort of material that is biodegradable, won't harm as much, but that is very similar to plastic. Uh, maybe we should use paper instead because paper can be burnt, whatever. It, it has practical uses other than just storing stuff in the form of a bag. Uh, reusable bags are 100% fine. Using less plastic is fine. Here's what I would support. I would support my county, and I, I would be there. I'd sign the petition where the residents of the county, government and citizens included, instead of taking legal action and using the government to forcefully ban certain products available to us that have practical uses, I would support a petition or a protest to redress grievances. I don't think it's really a... A grievance, is it? Anyway, it's a pretty petty grievance. Nonetheless, I would support this course of action to persuade or convince companies to find alternatives to plastic straws that are just as useful and hassle-free. Something that would potentially replace plastic bags. Maybe something even more efficient. Or something that doesn't harm the proficiency of cashiers. Those are all things that I would 100% support. And I think we could come together as a society, as people, as a community. We could come together and we could demand this from the places that we shop at, from the places that we give our hard-earned money to. I think that's a much preferable alter alternative. Even if it has the same effect economically, even if other people don't want it, if a private business decides, all right, we're not going to use plastic bags, I support that. And just a f even if it's not much of a difference, because obviously I don't see a doomsday world where people are sent off to prisons for using plastic bags or selling plastic bags. I, I don't see a doomsday world, but I think a philosophically, in a philosophical way, that is a much preferable philosophical argument or a course of action to take. And I think if we think that way, in more than one way, if it starts as small as, simple plastic straws and plastic bags where we can voluntarily deal with this problem, whether or not it's a quantifiable problem or an issue that is quantifiable enough to justify a course of action that requires course of coercion, sorry, a coercion or force. I'm all for, I'm all for voluntary action. If we can, if we can do that, something that small, just through human action, then I think we could do almost anything through human action. It's the principle of the thing. And to kind of diverge, but make the point about how it's the principle more so than an economic impact. Like, banning cars to save the environment, banning automobiles, is absolutely a terrible idea and would have a huge negative impact on the economy on people's personal lives, the standard of living. Plastic bags, probably not so much. It might be an inconvenience. It might slightly harm poor people. So, but, but I just want to make this clear. 
I lost my train. Oh, oh, okay. So, for example, I, I've gathered my thoughts. Sorry about that. I had a, a brain fart for whatever reason. The thoughts left my mind. Not that there was much there to begin with. A little self-deprecation doesn't hurt. Nonetheless, basically my main point was it's more about the philosophical underpinning of the thing. The, the principle of the issue. I think philosophically speaking, or the principle of the idea of people voluntarily coming together. To protest, to petition for a specific action by a private company to do a specific thing voluntarily is a much superior option than looking toward the government and asking them to use the legislative process to ban things. I think that's a much preferable way in principle. Because if we can't come together and voluntarily petition, protest, whatever whatever it may be, to have a company do something that the consumer wants that might have a positive impact, if we can't do that, then I don't think we can do anything. And I think doing this thing in principle will help us will rewire the way we think about issues related to not only our social life, but our geopolitical life. I think it would be beneficial to think about things in this way. What can we do voluntarily together through co cooperation without using coercion, force, and violence? And to further my point, to, to use an example, or... Uh, the scenario to make an analogy to really get my point across by how it's the principal thing. How it's the principle of the thing in a different extreme. Let's take the idea of theft. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what, what the hell does theft have to do with banning plastic bags? And it'll all make sense. Just uh, hear me out. Let's say, for example, you have a car. You spent a certain amount of money on anywhere between $1,000 to $30,000, depending on the year, the make of the car. It's a used car, but it's yours. Depending on whether or not you live in a house or an apartment, you either park it in your driveway or a parking spot or whatever it is. You go to bed, you wake up the next morning, your car is gone. Somebody stole your car. I don't know what they're going to use it for, but somebody stole the car. You would say, hey, that's pretty bad. That person deserves to be punished. I deserve to have my car back or the equivalent payment of my car. Plus, extra money for the hassle of having to go through the legal process and using resources and wasting my time to try to get a redress of grievances for my stolen car. Obviously, most people would agree that that act of theft was immoral, it was wrong, it shouldn't have happened. But we wouldn't feel the same way if somebody stole a candy bar from a convenience store, right? But, just listen, it, it all makes sense, but it's still the principle of theft that is wrong. You wouldn't treat somebody who stole a candy bar, a, a Kit Kat from a convenience store the same way as you would treat somebody that stole a car from somebody's parking spot or driveway. But you can still recognize the act that the act of stealing something that didn't belong to you, that you didn't rightfully earn, is still wrong. So, for example, while we might treat a carjacker to a candy bar thief, especially Kit Kat, we, we treat those as two distinct crimes, even though it's still based on the principle of theft. If you went to a grocery store and you were in charge of watching your younger sibling, uh, you were babysitting and you had to run to the store and you have the person with you, or it's your own kid. Let's say, for example, you're a parent, it's your kid, and your kid, while you're not looking, your four-year-old kid, five-year-old kid, whatever, six-year-old, whatever, 
stuffs a couple Kit Kats in his or her pocket. And then you walk out the store and then you discover later when you get home that your kid stole Kit Kats. Now, let's be 100% honest. You're not going to sit there and say, oh no, don't worry about it. It was just a Kit Kat. Go ahead and steal more Kit Kats. No, you'd probably reprimand them and say, hey, listen, that's not okay. If you want a Kit Kat, you have to buy it. You have to earn money and you have to earn the privilege of buying a Kit Kat. That's something that you would probably teach your kid. Most people, I would assume. You wouldn't say, go ahead, steal more Kit Kats. That's all right. So that just goes to show that the principle of theft, no matter how petty, how small, is typically an immoral thing. And that we reprimand it even on smaller scales. So this is how I'm looking at the issue of banning plastic bags. Because when we can establish the basic fact that laws are enforced through violence and coercion. Force. Is that is a plastic bag really something that we need to use the threat of violence or some sort of legal penalty Is that something that we really need to use in order to decrease our plastic pollution? Especially for something as simple as a plastic bag or a plastic straw. Couldn't we we come together as a society, as a community, as humans, voluntarily? And try to persuade or convince a private entity to stop using a particular product for these beneficial reasons? That really would have an insignificant cost. And we know it's an insignificant cost because most businesses do it anyway in places where stuff like this is banned. It's not a huge economic cost. So why wouldn't they voluntarily listen to a community that their business is in? And wouldn't that be much more preferable? And even though it's not a big deal because, you know, people are going to obey that law anyway and people probably won't be sent to prisons, it's still the, f- the principle of the thing. It's still the principle of the rule of law. The principle of taking coercive action to enforce a law. So that's the thought that I wanted to sort of implant in your head. And I want to be clear, it's not that this is something that really bothered me. I'm not going to lose sleep over the government banning plastic bags or plastic straws. And some of you might be asking, well, is this the hill that you're willing to die on? And I'd say, yeah, this is the hill that I'm willing to die on. It's about the principle of the thing. It's about the philosophical underpinning of our society and the way that we view the world, the ideological prism that we view the world through. I think it would be a much better world if we could look at the world and say, what can I do voluntarily without using taxes or the force of government to solve this particular issue? I think if we came together and thought that way, the world would be a much better place. So something as simple as a plastic bag or a plastic straw, I'm going to talk about it. Even if it doesn't lead to the death of people or a significant economic downturn. It's not really a detriment to have to use something that's not a plastic bag or a plastic straw. Inconvenient at times, but not a huge deal. But that doesn't mean I can't talk about the principle and philosophical underpinning or the lessons that we can have from this type of issue or legislative process or debate. Every small issue is ripe for political, economic, philosophical debate. That's my honest opinion on the issue. I hope you all have a good day.